Over to you, sir, if you got any opening comments before we start. Uh, no, I'm game. Let's just plunge right in. All right. Uh, hey, sir, uh, we, we've read the uh, warrior ethos a lot of the Marines have as well. Um, it, I, I like the compact nature of it, uh, the fact that uh, you can kind of throw this in your hip pocket. And, uh, and, and uh, if, you got a, if you got limited space, this is one of the books you can, you can carry. But um, uh, if, I, if I may uh, kind of go back to your first, uh, your, your kind of uh, major book that you wrote, uh, at least in the, for, for the Marine Corps, which was uh -huh. Gates of Fire. And uh, that really landed well with a lot of, uh, a lot of Marines uh, throughout the Marine Corps. And there's, there's a couple key points. It's probably one of my most favorite books, uh, especially as a, as a fiction book, but uh, based on a true story. Um, it, it really captured uh, the visceral nature of, of combat and uh, the struggles of, a, of an infantryman as he moves through the, the course of a battle and all the things he thinks of and all the, all the challenges that he faces. And so my question to you is, is um, uh, you probably could have taken that book different ways, but uh, I, I find it very unique that you focused on the individual soldier in, the, in this case, not so much like the commander. You see right. some books follow Dwight D. Eisenhower's thinking during the invasion of D-Day. Yeah, yeah. So on and so forth. So, what was the premise? And uh, I know you obviously did that deliberately, but uh, it, it, is that how you intended this book to go, or did it did it uh, go a direction you just kind of stumbled into? Well, I was a lance corporal myself, so all of you guys there are really exalted characters to me. But uh, so I definitely kind of I never really thought of writing the Gates of Fire any other way than as a story of, you know, the infantryman and the officer on the ground, which is, you know, really, uh, uh, I just, I never thought about doing it any other way. It seemed to me that um, the thing about that Greek style of warfare, Spartan style of warfare, you know, the close combat, shield to shield type of stuff, it was really about the individual man, you know, behind the shield. And uh, I thought it wouldn't be, you know, the, the grand perspective is, is interesting, so you know what it's all about. But uh, it wasn't really like Napoleon's battles or something like that where you're, you know, you have grand, grand tactics or anything. It was a narrow place. The bad guys were coming at you, and you had to stop them. You know, it was pretty simple. All right. Um, I'll turn it over to the audience if there's any questions here from, from the uh, team. Anyone? Afternoon, sir. I have a question in regards to your thoughts on how the West and Western society kind of villainizes uh, the Persians uh, during the Persian Creek Wars and just if you think that's an accurate representation of what kind of people they were or that's just how, you know, labeling it good versus bad and that's just our simple thought process. Did you say villainize, Captain? Yes, sir. Uh, they almost seen this evil, like in Star Wars, it's like the Empire, and you got Darth Vader, and um, you know, <laughs> take over the world. But however, if you look, you know, later on in history, with Alexander the Great coming from Macedonia, geographically not much, uh, not far away from the rest of the Greek nation states, you know, doing the same thing that the Persians wanted, you know, conquering the world. Uh, so I just wonder what your thoughts on that were, sir. Well, I felt like certainly. Uh... It was a real clear-cut good guy, bad guy scenario to me, the Battle of Thermopylae, in the sense that the, that the Persian is under Xerxes were just coming to be, were just a despotic, you know, uh, society where, not that there's anything wrong with that, but where the king, you know, rules everybody, owns everybody, can, and no one has any rights, no one has, you know, you can be killed at any time. Your property can be taken away from you at any time. Everybody lives in a rigid hierarchy where they're only trying to please the person above them and the one above them and above that, which is quite the opposite of our society, which our Western society. And particularly because um, democracy and the whole concept of self-government 
of the rule by the people was in its, such in its infancy at that time. You know, it wasn't like it had been around for thousands of years. It was, and it only really existed, you know, in Greece at that time among the, the city states there, so that it was ready to be snuffed out in the cradle. And the other aspect of it was the, the odds were so overwhelming. And then the whole sort of character of Xerxes, the, the, the concept or the contrast to, to Leonidas, where you think that at the battle there, where Xerxes is on a throne looking on, you know, with somebody serving him refreshments, whereas Leonidas is down there in the trenches and you can't even tell him from the rest of the guys. So it seemed to me to be a, you know, uh, a no brainer as to who the good guys were and who the bad guys were. Um, and um, so um, I, I certainly didn't tend to villainize the, the Persians there, just that they were coming from a different, uh, a different view of human nature, a different view of what, of what um, um, an individual's aspirations could be and what his duties were, what, what uh, he could aspire to. You know, one of the concepts that the, that the Persians had, I'm sorry, just to, that um, among the nobles, um, that the ideal was to, quote, unquote, to draw the bow and speak the truth. And I think that's really a great noble way of looking at things. Um, the only problem, of course, was, it was that it was that only applied among the very, you know, one, top, one tenth or one hundredth of one percent. And the rest of the people by the nature of, um, like say the Euphrates Valley and the nature of cultivation there, where basically everybody was just a chattel property of, of, the, of the landowners above them. That was, uh, so on the one hand, I, I do respect the Persian point of view, but on the other hand, I certainly respect the Greek point of view a lot more. Thank you, sir. So, sir, question for you. I, I've read a couple of reviews of the book. Uh, one, one, I love the book, so thank you for it. But one of your reviews, uh, you say that uh, in it lists uh, three impulses, shame, honor, and love. Uh, the honor and love, I, I can kind of relate to, but the shame part, I, I had a hard time trying to relate to shame. And you can expound on that on that for us um, and help us understand, it, especially as a young leader trying to understand shame involved in it. If you could help us with that. All right, that's a good question, really good question. I mean, one of the things they say about uh, the samurai society and about Spartan society was that it was a shame-based culture. And I know we always tend to think of uh, shame as like a bad thing, but I think, um, and actually the character of Dionicus comments on this at, and directly at a couple points in the book, that the Spartans used shame intensely to, um, as a kind of a, a counterpoise to the fear that the troops were going to experience in battle. So that um, uh, an individual felt like uh, if he were to um, show a lack of courage in the face of the enemy, that he knew that when he, when he went home, or even just when he returned to his mates, that they were they were gonna, he would feel so ashamed and that they would, you know, lay that on him big time, that uh, that was a real uh, source of um, motivation to uh, stand fast and, you know, and do his duty in the, in the, in the moment of extreme fear. For, in, for instance, in, um, in, the, in true Sparta, above and beyond the fictional aspect of it, if a, if a warrior returned from a battle and he had shown any sort of cowardice or fear or anything like that in the face of the enemy, the young girls in Sparta would surround him when he walked on the street and singing these songs of ridicule to him. And the, uh, um, there are many stories of Spartan mothers who would basically, you know, kick their sons out if they, of the, you know, disown them if they showed any, any kind of uh, fear in battle. And there were many other aspects of the society that just kind of applied shame across the board. Um, one of the stories of uh, 
there was one survivor, Spartan, uh, named Aristotomus of, of Thermopylae. And the reason was he had an inflammation of the eyes and was virtually blind. So they sent him home. And so he did not participate in the Battle of Thermopylae. He was the only one. And a year later, when the Spartan army faced the Persians at a place called Plataea, in a straight up fight, straight up, you know, infantry fixed battle, um, when the fight was over, everybody declared, they, have to, they gave a prize of valor. Everybody de 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 agreed that this Spartan, Aristotomus, was the bravest on the field because he was running around like out of the formation, just putting himself in the path of death. And they didn't give him because, in other words, because he felt so much shame at not being, um, not being there at Thermopylae, not dying with all the others. And so in the end, they decided not to give him the prize of valor because they felt that it was more important to stay in ranks, do your job, and not be running around like a crazy guy trying to get yourself killed. So that sort of, uh, I think, shame as kind of a counterpoise to fear. That was something that, that the Spartans do. And if you think about the samurai, the whole idea that uh, if you failed in any way, that you had to take your own life, right? Um, so uh, that's, that's what I meant by, by shame. Great, thank you. So uh, I add on to that, sir. So for the young leaders in the room, how can, and if you can, can we relate that to them using that, that same method or that same mindset today? Uh, and I guess that's where I, I really want to go with that. Is there any way we oh. correlate that today in today's society for the young I mean, I, it's, a, it's a really good question. I, I certainly don't have any program to do that. And I think a lot of times in in groups of young men and women, even if you think about a basketball team or a football team, it it almost produces that whole quality by itself, right? The the one person who might have screwed up in one way or another had a weak moment, people are going to let him know about it, you know, even if it's only only with a glance or something like that. Now, personally, I'm not so sure that's the highest form or the best way to do it. I think it's a real kind of primitive way of doing it, and I'm not sure that it's it's even a good way of doing it in terms of advancing the sort of moral level of, of the individual. Uh, I mean, I, I, I would rather go for the leading by example style. I don't know if you guys saw, um, if you've had a time to watch that Michael Jordan series that's been on yes, with The Last Dance, you know? Yes, you can see that, I mean, he laid shame very thickly <laughs> on everybody, you know? <laughs> But he also, to his credit, I think, as he would explain it, he said, uh, you know, this is a war. We're in a war here, you know, and, and when we get to the playoffs, you guys, are, everybody's going to have to really elevate their game because, it, you know, everybody else, our opponents are. And so he would say, um, I know I'm going to be at the highest level and I want everybody else to be at that level with me. Um, so that's uh, – a sort of a slightly half shame, half leading by example way of uh, leadership. Oh, I appreciate. It. I, I didn't. I didn't think about using that one, but I'm putting that one in my tool bag. I'll take that one. <laughs> Questions? Sure, the team here. Right. Sir, I was wondering if you could talk about how the warrior, warrior ethos fits in with modern American society. How much you thought about that? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the start of that. Could you say that again? So I was wondering if you could talk about how the warrior ethos fits in with modern American society. And ah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, first, if we contrast it to Sparta, ancient Sparta, where you had a warrior society, the army, the guys who were actually going to fight, embedded within a warrior culture where, um, as I said about those, the, the young girls who would sing those anthems of ridicule, and, and the, if you remember those first few stories about the mothers in Sparta, you know, where the, they were, where the, the, even the women, even the children, even the young girl children would enforce the ideals of, of the warrior society at all, at all times. So um, 
it was it was it was much easier, I think, in those days for a Spartan warrior to really get with the program and stay with it. They really had no choice. You know, even if they were hanging out with their grandmother, their grandmother was kicking their ass, you know. But American society is quite completely different if you think about it. I mean, American society is sort of, it's split down the middle. On the one hand, Americans, I'm talking about civilian society, the society that the Marine Corps is embedded within. On the one hand, it is kind of a warrior culture. If you think about uh, Dallas Cowboy football games or NASCAR or, or um, anything like that, it's a, it's a real uh, kill or be killed, we win at all costs, you know, that sort of thing. You know? So that kind of does reinforce that warrior culture. But the other half of American society, which is about making money, chasing pleasure, um, chasing distraction, uh, living the easy life, um, that is like completely at odds with the ideals that you guys and, and gals embody, you know, the ideals of service, nobody's paying you, nobody's getting rich in the Marine Corps, but out there in the real world, you see, you know, Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin, you know, bragging about how he's got his signature on dollar bills, you know, so it's a really a challenge, I think, for anybody, not just the Marine Corps or, mil or the military, but first responders, police, doctors, frontline nurses, things like that, I'm sure that people feel that they're fighting a lonely battle and that's not really appreciated. I mean, people will say to you, right, thank you for your service and that sort of stuff. And that lands like a, you know, like a turd, if you ask me, you know? Um, so uh, it, it's, I think for you guys, it's a, it's a real mental and emotional challenge to maintain your ideals, the ideals that you join with in your mind, in the midst of a greater society that sometimes pays lip service to those ideals, but in fact is living out a whole other completely different thing. I was just saying the other day uh, that um, if we could beam an ancient Athenian into, into our, this room, your room right now, or into, let's say, the wider culture. Let's say the wider culture. We could beam them into uh, a cocktail party or something. The Athenian would fit right in because they were, you know, a cosmopolitan city, a, a great seaport that people came from all over the world. They had uh, drama, law courts, politics, assembly. They had corruption. It was it, they, an Athenian would fit right in. But if we could beam a Spartan in here today, he would be like somebody from another planet. And I'm sure that you guys and gals sometimes must feel that way. And I also think about the Spartan, if you beamed him into a modern American culture today, he would utterly despise us. I mean, despise the civilian half of it. He would see the pursuit of money, the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of everything that was superficial, the avoidance of any kind of adversity. And he would just shake his head and say, the human race has just gone down the tubes. Everything, the, our worst fears have been realized, you know? So, but I think he would be right at home if he were in that room with you guys right now. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. Anything else? Yes. I've got plenty of questions, so you don't want to hear me speak for the entire time. Good questions. All right, uh, I'll ask another one, sir. Um, in reading your books, uh, which are great, by the way, um, the one of the interesting things about them all is I, I feel there's such a connection to our modern day national security challenges in that um, our next fight, the one that we face, um, you know, and I, in my, my opinion, in the next few years, uh, maybe as long as a decade uh, uh, against the Chinese. Uh, we'll, we'll call upon all of our faculties. Uh, we will question, you know, some parts of our society may question why we're even at war. Other parts uh, would have been seeing this trend coming for a long time. And so there will be a clash of societal um, um, of, uh, concern, basically. And, and in the middle of all that will be our military force. 
and bringing the um, bringing the fight uh, wherever it may be in the Pacific somewhere. Uh, you know, obviously, God forbid we, we ever have to go down this path, but uh, I think your books kind of prepare the mind in some in, in many ways for those kind of fights. And, and in the uh, book, um, Warrior Ethos, you talk about the will to victory. And, um, and almost this, um, this, this bold assumption that we are going to win the next war. And, um, you know, when, when I, when I speak about that publicly in kind of my own circles, um, you can almost get a sense of, I don't know if we're going to win this, the next war because the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have shown us that, uh, uh, a, a force with armed with AK-47 and two magazines of ammunition and some flip-flops can hold an infantry battalion at bay um, and some IEDs laid on the streets. And so things have changed in warfare since the ancient uh, Spartans. And I'm just wondering if, um, if you think that uh, we are ready for the next major conflict, uh, if our minds, if our will is ready. Uh, training and equipment and all the technologies aside, uh, humans are more important than hardware. So the question becomes, uh, from what you've seen and from your perch, uh, what do you think we need to do to improve our mental strength? And uh, I, I personally, I think books are reading, getting that thousand-year-old mind is a part of it. But uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with General Mattis that that thousand-year mind is a great one. But um, let me see, I'll, I'll give you kind of a long answer to this. There's also there's a wonderful book that I recommend highly to you guys called The Western Way of War by Victor Davis Hanson. And I, I'll, I'll, pair, I'll, I'll give you the short version of it right here. Um, Victor Davis Hanson is a professor at uh, Fresno State here in California. And, uh, but he's also a, um, a farmer. And, uh, and, and he's a professor of antiquities. He studies Sparta and Greece and all, all of that stuff back there. And his, one of the things he says is that our Western concept, not just America, but England, Europe, you know, the, the whole Western world, our concept of what war is derived straight from the ancient Greek view of things, which was a, 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 a um, you know, one side lining up on one side of the field, the other side lining up on the other, go come together, clash at arms, whoever wins, wins. In other words, a straight up fight. And if you think of um, all the way down through history, that was the way Alexander fought. You know, he... He, their concept, well, that was the way Napoleon fought, the way Caesar fought, the way Hannibal fought, the way everybody down through our own civil war, um, and of course, World War II, that the concept that the generals were trying, had in their own minds, was that everything they did was designed to bring the enemy to one big decisive battle. You know, whether it was the Battle of the Bulge or Gettysburg or you know, uh, Galgamela, anything like that. So that's kind of the Western concept. And in a way, I think the Marine Corps is, is kind of built on that, or the, the original old concept of, of heavy firepower, of a straight up fight, you know, we'll kick your ass, that type of thing, right? But the wars that we fought since Korea have, the rule, that rule book is gone because, uh, the enemy doesn't fight that way, you know, or at least the way the wars were, you know, in Vietnam, again, one aspect of, of wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam, were all on the, the enemy's home turf and where there, were there, where there was a situation where um, the individual fighters could melt back into the people, could melt back into the jungle. They didn't wear uniforms, et cetera, et cetera. And so, the, that, that our Western concept, I mean, if you think about what we did when we went into Vietnam, we went into Iraq, we went into Afghanistan, first thing we do is we build a giant base or a number of giant bases, right, where air power can be brought to bear. 
And then we have various sort of either enclaves or patrols or fire bases or, you know, kind of satellite things out among the actual, you know, people of the country. And that's that way of fighting, I think. Here I am, I'm trying to be a general, I'm only an E3, right? But um, that was, I think, very outmoded thinking. Um, and uh, then when you look at terrorism, terrorism took it a whole other level beyond um, just say the black pajama guys in Vietnam. And now when you look at like what Russia is doing with cyber warfare, with uh, the you know, phony websites trying to divide, um, you know, black from white, young from old, east from west, north from south, that, you know, and their whole thing in uh, Ukraine where these uh, little green men come in and they don't have any insignia and they don't have whatever, that they're, they're playing, they've thrown the rule book away, you know, and I think the reason they have is because they, they know that in a straight up fight, in an old school fight, America will kick their ass, you know? Um, so they don't do that. Even Russia doesn't do that, you know? Um, so what I'm more worried about, I think if it does ever come down to a, a straight up fight in the Pacific, I, I, I'm not worried about the Marine Corps or, or anybody else on our side. I think we'll quit ourselves with honor. Um, but what scares me is the these kind of uh, dirty trick wars that we're that we're in now, you know, um, because you know, let's be honest. I mean, the Russians are winning. They're with with their cyber warfare and the things they've done. Considering that, whatever their economy is the size of Italy, something like that. They're basically a kleptocracy, you know, where the Putin and his buddies, you know, own like ninety percent of the wealth, and everybody else is screwed. And somehow. They've affected our elections. God knows what they're going to do this time. Um, so I'm more worried about do we as a country have, how do we fight that? Are we even thinking about it? Is there anybody even trying to do something about that? So I'm not sure if that's an answer to your question, Colonel, but that's, that's, what, that's what's on my mind at the moment. No, it's, a, it's interesting you bring that up. And um when, when you were talking, I was imagining uh, Alexander the Great while he's trying to convince his army to go deep into India. And he's at the, and everyone, all of his soldiers are complaining about being so far from home and they haven't been home in years. And even though they are wealthy and they have amassed all these riches, and Alexander the Great continues to preach upon his soldiers that, but these experiences, and I've made your dreams come true. And he's trying to reach his people on another level and uh, convince them to continue uh, beyond, uh, in, in, into deep into India. Um, and you can almost see where he is, um, his supply lines, yes, may be extended, but what really broke well before that was the will of his, of his soldiers. And uh, even though they were the greatest fighting force to ever amass on the globe to that point, uh, the, the thing that defeated them at that point was obviously Alexander's death, premature death, whatever caused it, but his force just kind of gave up and he had to, had, he had to turn back. And um, in, in much the same way, uh, that, that's what concerns me, is that uh, we will, like you said, acquit ourselves on a force on force battle um, heroically and we will win but uh, I'm afraid we'll never get that chance because we will have defeated ourselves and uh, to your point with the Russians and what the Chinese are doing and, uh, and uh, um, they are basically fighting this war already and the war is for our minds and so I, I think as we read these books and we see the Afghan campaign and we see the struggles and we see uh, what the average soldier endured in, uh, during the Battle of Thermopylae, uh, you realize that uh, wars are won between, like General Mattis likes, likes to say, between the six inches between your ears. And uh, if you engage that uh, before you engage your weapon. 
And so um, I, I appreciate these, these, these books and this discussion too, because it, it just highlights what maybe most of us individually realize, but maybe not collectively understand that uh, this, we're really right now, we're in a fight for our, our wills. Yeah, if I can, uh, uh, let me say one thing that I think might, is, is actually hopeful. I don't wanna be bringing everybody down. <laughs> but I, I think that uh, America right now is in a real um, moral crisis. You know, like speaking what you just said, Colonel, about Alexander and his men getting tired. The, the, uh, when they were in India and they'd been on the road and fighting forever, what re why they really gave up was that the, the idea of what are we fighting for? You know, for, for Alexander as the king and his aspiration to be, you know, for glory, that's, that, that kept him going. But what about the individual guy who has, you know, two sons at home that are now 15 years old and he's never even seen them, you know? Um, so um, the will ran out there. But I think that what we have to decide as a society now, and I'm kind of shooting my mouth off, maybe talking out of school or above my pay grade, but we really have to ask ourselves and come together here and say, what, what is this country all about? You know, what are our, our ideals? You know, we talk a lot about the founding fathers these days and, and trying to go back to, um, is this a constitutional republic that, it, that, 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 that has a bill of rights and that cares about the weakest and the most vulnerable in the society? Or are we, you know, an authoritarian state, you know, where powers go to the executive branch and, and there's no such thing as accountability or anything like that. And what I think we have going in our favor, when we think about going against China or going against Russia or going against those allies is that basically to me, they're a bunch of cheaters. Their whole concept is to cheat. You know, whether it's Russia that's been cheating in the Olympic Games with steroids and everything forever and cheating in everything that they do. And the same thing with China. They're stealing our intellectual property. They're hacking into our stuff, you know. So I think that America still, it, it's, its beating heart is still great. And it still is innovative. And it's still, as I look at you guys there in that room, I mean, I, I, know, I can see that you, that you have ideals and aspirations that are honorable, you know, and that that's what you're trying to do. You're not trying to win at all costs and be the shittiest possible people you could be as long as you can win. You're trying to be your highest selves, you know? And uh, so I, I do think that still is, despite the troubles that we have today, that still is the American beating heart. And I still have faith in it. Questions? Go ahead. So you've kind of mentioned it twice now, and I think you might have answered part of my question. Uh, you mentioned once uh, about dirty warfare or trickery, kind of, and then cheating. Um, to that country, it might just seem like an advancement in tactics and advancement in warfare, um, or for an example, adapting and overcoming, as we would teach our Marines. Is that because? you think it's trickery or cheating because of an ethical or moral dilemma or just because they're the enemy. So it's just dirty because we're not the ones benefiting. Well, that's a, that's a great point. And there's a lot to be said about, you know, if we didn't have air power and we only had, you know, whatever rice we could carry on our back then we try to adapt and, and you probably come up with the same tactics as uh, some of our, some of our enemies use. But, um, so I, you know, I, I have to take my hat off to the way, you know, when they're overwhelmed and that asymmetrical warfare is certainly something that, that can be done. But if you think about China or you think about Russia, where, you're th where the, this stuff is coming from absolutely from the top, you know, from the top of the executive and the whole concept of, of, the, of their way of, of fighting is, is to cheat. And... Um, I can't believe that that doesn't destroy the moral fiber of the individual of the individual fighting it. Even beyond uh, just cheating, like us versus them or them versus us, that whole concept rolls down the bureaucracy, rolls down the chain of command. 
so that everybody knows that um, the person below them is going to is going to cheat to get ahead of them, and the person above them is going to try to steal their credit and screw them, and you know to get ahead, right? And it's I mean I've heard Russia described as uh, I don't know if this is the right phrase an an intelligence community under Russia under Putin that it's all about surveillance. It's, you know, it's the triumph of the KGB mentality. And I just cannot believe that over time, over the long game, that that doesn't destroy a society from within. You know, we're destroying ourselves in our own way, being a consumer society and a selfish society. And, you know, I'm getting mine and the hell with you, that type of thing. But I think we're coming to a reckoning, a moral reckoning, and uh, I'm hoping that we come out on the right side of it. So, sir, that that's a kind of a perfect segue for me because uh, I hear you talk about courage as being one of the, uh, or probably the best ethos that you think a person should display. Can you expound on why you feel courage is probably the best out of the uh, warrior ethos? Um. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear. Could you say that again? I didn't. Yes, sir. You you talk about courage being the top of the uh, uh -huh. ethos. Why why is courage more important, and why is the the top of the warrior ethos? Why do you feel um, courage is the number one? I'm not so sure that it is the most important. I mean, it's something that one can't do without. But I'm thinking these days that uh, um, the more moral virtues are more important. In which I would I would say um, empathy and accountability and um, patience and uh, the uh, the ability to to put oneself in the shoes of people under them and people over them and like one of the things that I admire you guys for is you're all you're all leaders. What you're here trying to to learn today is to help the people that you're teaching. Right, you're all in the role of being mentors and teachers, and I think, and I and I salute you for that. I think that's that that's a very that's a moral. The virtues that you guys are are seeking to enhance in yourselves are moral virtues, ethical virtues, and I, I think I think those are at least as important as courage. It obviously, you can't do without courage in a straight up fight, but in getting to there, I think. Uh, you know that that the moral the moral virtues are at least as important, if not more. Thank you, sir. I, I, any other questions? I got plenty. Okay, um, sir. A question for you is this: is um, uh, so I, I I'm trying to put my shoe uh, my 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 mind in the shoes of Stephen Pressfield when he writes uh, uh, and. The way I imagine it is that maybe you travel to these locations or maybe you read other books, but how do you go about uh, writing in the way that you do and achieving the kind of, of, um, of, uh, of story uh, that, that you do? Well, what's, what's your secret sauce if you care? care? <laughs> well, I could talk for about f three weeks on that subject. Um, I, uh, in a story like Gates of Fire, which comes from a real event, I try to, I always sort of ask myself, looking at kind of the global concept of that story, I ask myself, I'm a big believer in theme. I'm probably going to get into the weeds here a little bit with you in a literary talk, but, uh, and I ask myself, what is this story about? You know? Not the subject matter, not that it's about a fight, you know, blah, blah, blah. But what's, what's the real essence of it? And to me, the essence of, of the Spartan stand at Thermopylae was that unlike almost every other battle in history, the Spartans knew they were going to die from the start. It wasn't like they went into this thinking, well, maybe we'll win, or maybe we'll survive, or maybe there's glory at the end of this. They knew, they knew that this was about their own death, you know, and they totally handled it, you know. They acted completely with honor. But the other, the other thing was that 
when I asked myself, what was this about? That battle and the whole Spartan way of life was, or that whole way of fighting was to me about fear. That that type of fighting where one army would line off across from another and, and, and had all that time to anticipate what was going to happen and had to progress, you know, um, one step at a time toward the enemy. And then when it finally, the action finally happened, that it was, you know, not something where a bullet would take you out or anything like that, but it was really, you know, I mean, it, fear must have been a tremendous, tremendous part of that. And so as I'm thinking about this as a writer, I'm thinking that the whole Spartan culture was about overcoming fear. We were talking about shame a little earlier, that that was one of the things that they used. And that was why the, the character of Dionicus throughout the whole story is asking, what is the opposite of fear? And he comes up with all of the different things that shame is, that's one thing that could be counterpoised against fear, but he finds that that's insufficient. It's just putting one fear up against another. And he talks about the ideal of being an officer and having care for your men that you can forget your own fear because you're, you're taking care of your men. Every year, your ideal is for them. But he still says, you know, that I don't count that as the opposite of fear either. It's not the pure thing I'm looking for. And then he, he thinks of a guy like Polonikis, who was just like a born warrior, just like a lion. And he says, well, that guy has no fear. But that, I don't count that either because he's like a Michael Jordan type of guy. He's one in a million. And... He finally comes up with the, his final answer to the thing was that the opposite of fear was love. And what he meant by that was the, the bonds between the warriors, the glue that held the phalanx together, you know? And so as I'm, as I'm trying to come up with a story or trying to make that story, tell that story, that historical story, I'm trying to, to weave that deeper, what to me is a deeper meaning into it. But it's not, I know this is a much longer answer than you were asking for, Colonel, but that it's not me as a writer trying to impose that theme on it, but that theme to me sort of arose out of the reality of the story. So in, in writing about, say, Alexander the Great, I would there would be a whole other different theme. Um, but that's kind of my my, my sort of the way I look at, to, at the spine of any kind of story. Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, are you working on another book right now, if you care to share? Uh, yeah, I have another book uh, that it's coming out in the spring right now. Um, do you want me to tell you a little bit about yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> the inside scoop. Yeah. It's, uh, um, it's also said in the ancient world, but rather than being a story about a society or a, or, a, or a group or a unit, it's about one individual. And um, I have this recurring character named Telamon of Arcadia, who is a uh, solitary mercenary of the ancient world, kind of like a Clint Eastwood, man with no name, gunslinger type of character. And he has, he has this sort of uh, dark philosophy of life where he's, uh, he's been wounded, he's been hurt, he doesn't believe in anything anymore, he has no more ideals, he kind of fights for money and nothing else. And in this, in this story, I have him on a, a kind of a, uh, he takes on an assignment where there's a young girl that he has to protect. And, and the story is about him changing and evolving out of that, guy who cares about nothing to somebody who cares about another human being. And um, so it's sort of like what I was saying before that I think the moral and the ethical virtues are more important than the virtues of courage. So here's a, a character who's got courage up the yin yang, but who is, doesn't have any moral sense except a, a selfish sense. And, his, and through this story, he changes and um, opens his heart to another aspect. And that's kind of really what I hope we can do collectively in America, where these days we're now, so partisanship has taken over so much, you know, that we, 
you know, one side hates the other and the other side hates the other. It doesn't trust the other and thinks the other is the devil. And it didn't used to be like that. You know, it wasn't like that in World War II. It wasn't like that on Iwo Jima. Um, and uh, I think somehow we've got to come back and uh, to, uh, to, be, to, to be one again. And that's one of the great things about the Marine Corps, that it really is a unit where you're, everybody's green. You know, that's the color. And, you know, God bless you guys or gals. I salute you for everything you're doing, including this thing today. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Uh, any other questions? Sir, according to my watch, we got about uh, 15 more minutes with you. Um, any other questions? For the I, 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 I yes, sir. To tie into that, uh, and we've, you know, the country also felt pretty unified after 9 11, right? But if you had any advice for us in the room of how to keep the faith in the society that can just as easily turn on us like a dime, example, Vietnam, what, what's the silver lining? What's that hope that, that we can trust in society to continue to support us? I think that you guys and anybody that are, you guys really are in the vanguard. And you're the you're the leaders, and people are going to come around to to uh, to what you are eventually. So it is a question of kind of keeping the faith. You know, they say that um, I don't know. If, are you are you familiar with the Freemasons? The history of the Freemasons at all? A little bit, sir. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of like the gist of it was it was that these guys were had access to the higher knowledge, whatever that might be, alchemy, turning lead into gold, whatever, they were philosophers or whoever. And when the dark ages came in, you know, in the 700 AD, that kind of thing, and on the way through the, you know, the middle ages, um, they sort of felt like they had to keep the flame. You know, they had to, that they were on to something and uh, that they had, they had to keep the flame. And I think in many ways, that's, that's you guys' role. You're, you're sort of, I think, each one on his individual journey, and the Marine Corps and the military on its own collective journey is, is trying to keep evolving, keep moving to the, next, to the next level, to a higher level. And, but at the same time, I think uh, you, you already kind of have the flame. It's just a matter of kind of... Uh, um, not losing your nerve, you know, um, not having a failure of nerve. I think the greater society right now is having a failure of nerve, the greater American society, you know, that we were, you know, uh, you want me to get political? Can I get political for a second? It's you, sir. Uh, I think that when this country elected Barack Obama, a black man as president, and was on the brink of electing a woman as president, that we were at that point, whatever thing you may say against, you know, Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or anything like that, and I see all that stuff too, but we were at the, the highest point we'd ever been in terms of um, realizing the ideals of the founding father, that all men are created equal, et cetera, et cetera. And I think, the whole society, or at least a big part of it, um, just couldn't handle it. It was too much, you know, and, and they had a failure of nerve. Um, and the pendulum swung back the other way into, uh, um, I'm looking out for me and the hell with you, that type of thing. And, um, but you guys, like I said, are a society within that society. And I, I do think that you are keeping the flame, and uh, and I, I think that's that's your role. Um, you know, it's going to be the real challenge for the military. I think coming up is keeping from becoming politicized. You know, right now I think the military is 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 solid, um, and certainly General Mattis. That was his whole thing that he would say. Um, 
he, in fact, I've heard him say that. You guys probably saw that same clip, you know, that we have to sort of weather this storm, you know, keep the faith. And uh, I, I would say the same thing. I think he's right on. Awesome. It's, a, it's a big burden on your shoulders. We had some more questions from the team. Yes, go ahead. You want to ask anything? So, uh, trying to kind of change the title a little bit. If there's anything you could go back to Lance Corporal Pressfield and tell him, what would it be? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was, um, I don't know, you know, you're, we're all going to have to live our lives, right? We're all going to make mistakes. We're going to take a lot of detours. I mean, I didn't have my first novel published till I was 55 years old. So I went down a lot of dead ends and a lot of blind alleys. And I don't know if I could have told that Lance Corporal anything. He wouldn't have listened to me. You know, <laughs> he had to make his mistakes. Um, but uh, I guess if I had to say one thing, we're all on our own individual journey and, and we have inside us, whether we realize it or not, we all have a little gyroscope and a little North star. And we all, we all already are the people that we were meant to be. And as we take detours and wrong turns, if we just keep our eyes open, we'll come back to the right course, whatever it may be. I mean, for a lot of you, um, the Marine Corps may be just a, just a phase, you know, you'll move on to another thing and another thing and another thing. And for some, it's, it's a complete career and you'll stay with it, you know, all the way through. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think, I don't think I could have told that Lance Corporal anything. He was going to screw up in his own way. Uh, but you know, I'm now like about to turn 77 years old. And that's kind of a geezer, you know, but I can look, I can sort of, when I look back on things, it does seem like there is a pattern and there's a pattern for every one of you guys too. You know, it's just not clear right now or it's only partly clear right now, but um, I don't know, just had, uh, I would tell that corporal to have faith, be brave, keep going forward, keep following whatever, whatever uh, North star he, he saw inside him. Happy sir. Thank you. Um, Going to a, another question about um, uh, your early uh, writing. Uh, you wrote the, uh, the screenplay, as I understand it, for The Legend of uh, Bagger Vance. Actually, uh, I didn't. No, I just wrote the book. Oh, you wrote the book. I wrote the book. Correction. They immediately fired me. I had nothing to do with the book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so, truly, truly, they did. Uh, and that's, fact, I'll tell you the story. I know before you even answer the question. Yes. Yeah. the question. Um, the way it works in the movie business is whoever the original writer is, if you wrote a novel or you wrote the first screenplay, as soon as the movie gets ready to roll, meaning as soon as they have a cast and they have a budget and they have a director, first thing they do is they fire the writer because they don't want him, this pain in the ass guy standing around saying, you know, I didn't see it that way, you know? So I got a phone call from the producer, a wonderful guy named Jake Everts, and he told me, you know, he was firing me and uh, that Robert Redford was going to be the director and he had his own writer. Da, 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 da. And so what I said to Jake was I thanked him because it was the first time ever that I'd been fired to my face. You know, the way you usually find out about it is you read about it in the newspapers. And so I, I thanked him for being a, a gentleman and for having the courage to fire me to my face. So, yeah, I didn't write that. But anyway, I interrupted you. What were you going to say, Colonel? No, so I was uh, asking that, uh, you know, that's, I, I don't know wh where that success really landed in your life, but uh, that was an early success, I guess, in your writing career, as I understand it. I may be wrong, but um, uh, how, how did you move beyond that, given that a book you've written is now on the big screen and being directed by one of the most famous directors in American movie history. And moving beyond that, uh, did that just energize you? Or uh, I'm glad to see that you continue to write and continue to be successful and uh, to all of our, um, uh, to, all, to all of our benefit. But uh, 
what what was that pivotal moment like in your in your career? You know that that that's a good question because it, it it really was a pivotal moment for me. Um, like I, I'm thinking back again to the Michael Jordan thing to the Last Dance. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm forgetting exactly what it was, but I think there was one shot that he made in one of the early playoffs when the Bulls hadn't really found their footing yet. It was when I think Doug Collins was still coach. And, but, and Doug Collins made a comment that that was the shot that made the team feel like they, they had turned the corner and that they could now, you know, become good. Whereas they were struggling before that. And so yeah, that was that, you know, that was not an overnight success by any means. I mean, I made like 25 grand for the book and that was it. And I spent that, I had spent that like a year earlier. So, <laughs> but, but it did give me the, the courage to feel like, ah, I can, I can do this. And in fact, the next book was Gates of Fire. So I was already sort of writing that at the time. Um, but you're right. That was that was a that was a moment. I think we do have those moments in our life that might not be the be all and end all moment, but at least you turn a corner and you can kind of see ahead of you a path that you, that you can that you can excel at. Yes, sir. Uh, we're getting close to our end time here, but um, I'll uh, I'll see if you got any final comments before I close, sir. Um. All right, I'll, I'll get a little esoteric here. Um, I think that, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of, of the archetypes of the unconscious. Forgive me for getting a little deep here, but I'll do it. You know, this, this was a kind of a, a, a Carl Jung concept that within our, our brains from birth are these archetypes. And I'll give you an example. Uh, they're sort of super personalities that are already there in our psyche buried. Like for instance, the divine child, the youth, the wanderer, the lover, the warrior, the trickster, the artificer, the king, the queen, the sage, the mystic. And you guys right now are in the warrior archetype. And these, the archetypes kind of um, follow one another. And as we mature, one archetype succeeds another. And, and the, um, each succeeding, like for instance, you guys actually are probably not 100% in the warrior archetype. You're also in the next war archetype, which is the mentor or the teacher, you know, the father, the husband, where your role now is a little less actually delivering firepower onto the enemy and more, although that's still there, but it's more about helping those beneath you to achieve their potential, you know? And beyond that, um, beyond that goes uh, the archetype of, eventually, the archetype of the king and the sage and the, and the mystic. And Alexander was somebody who was trying, who was a warrior, who was trying to be a king, trying to move to the next one. And when I say the king archetype, I know I'm getting deep in the weeds here, but bear with me a little bit. It's the, the idea of that when the king is strong, the kingdom prospers. When the king rules with justice and with wisdom, the land flourishes and the people thrive. And so all I want to say to you guys is that whatever journey each one of you is individually on, there's a guiding mechanism already in your psyche and in, in all of our psyches and that we all mature from archetype to archetype and you guys have probably gone from the youth the seeker the wanderer to the warrior and now your mentors and your teachers fathers mothers husbands wives and beyond that are higher higher um expressions of the archetype and uh but everything that you're learning now will stay with you um, and, and you will be able to build on it. So I think, again, I might, if I have to leave you with any thought, I think you guys are carrying the flame, whether you realize it or not. And that, that uh, 
each one of you individually and collectively, there's a destiny there and it will unfold. And, and um, so I, I'd say be awake to that, watch for it in your lives and, and live up to it if you can. And I'm sure you will. Sir, I appreciate that. And, um, uh, but if there's anything I could tell you that uh, you've inspired a generation of, of uh, Marines uh, who have uh, read your books and have uh, learned about the art of warfare um, through, through your pages. And I um, uh, appreciate the time that you have given us and uh, out of your day and look forward to that, uh, that, that next book to land in the spring. And uh, uh, hope all is well with you and, and your, uh, your family there. But Thanks very uh, much, Colonel. And I, I say it back to you. I salute all you guys. You're way above me in the rank structure, and I look up to you. And uh, okay, the name of the book is A Man at Arms, if you can remember that. Look for it in the spring. God bless you, and keep on doing what you're doing. Thanks for having me. All right, thanks, sir. Thanks, sir.